I want to begin by saying that each of the recorders of the life and ministry of Jesus, each of them, when I'm talking about, I'm talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the ones who recorded his eyewitness, their eyewitness account of his life, each one of them had their own individual perspective and background, and thus that influenced the writing of their record or, or gospel. Uh, they were uh, contemporaries, uh, obviously, they all lived at the same time, these uh, individuals, and they experienced pretty much the same events. But because of who they were and the audience that they were writing for, each of their accounts, even though they describe the same events, each of their accounts come out with a different emphasis, different details. Now when I say different, I don't mean uh, contradictory. I'm just saying that each gospel writer was looking at the same thing from a, a, from a different angle. And so they describe the same details in different, in different ways. What makes it interesting. And some of them say, well, why, 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 why wasn't there only one? You know? Well, we're different people, aren't we? You ask people, you know, what's, your, what's your favorite book? And someone will say, well, uh, I, I really love the book of Luke, or others, oh, they swear by John. John's, if I only had one gospel, it'd be John. You know? Why is that? Well, because we're different people, that's why. We, we have different personalities, that we think differently, and so God in His wisdom uh, assigned a witness to four very different men to tell the very same story. And that is what accounts for the differences that we see. So in our particular class, um, we're, going to, uh, we're going to look at Matthew's gospel as Matthew describes Jesus as a royal figure, the king of the Jews, the king of heaven. That, that, is, that is Matthew's perspective. If we were to do Mark, on the other hand, then Mark would be describing Jesus as the powerful son of God. So Mark focuses a lot of his attention on the miracles of Jesus. And Mark's gospel is very short, very to the point. He did this, he did that, he went here, he did this, he did that. You know, very concise, but focused on the miracles of Jesus. Luke, on the other hand, we know that he's a doctor, it says that, but he's also a historian. And so Luke is interested in showing Jesus as fully human. It's not that he denies that he's divine, but he, he really wants to focus his attention on dem demonstrating that Jesus was not a ghost or some sort of spirit or appearance. He was actually a person who lived in uh, history. So Luke demonstrates that even though Jesus uh, is the divine Son of God, he was no less human and he experienced a very human life. So that's why there are a lot of dates you know, a, lot, a lot of historical markers in the book of Luke, so you can pinpoint when the action is taking place. And then John's gospel is the most philosophical of the four accounts. He was, or rather, he uses imagery, you know, Jesus is the light. He uses this kind of imagery to convey the concept that Jesus was the embodiment of God's truth. And many uh, say that John's gospel aimed not, of course, to the Jews, but he's thinking of a Gentile uh, audience uh, for, his, uh, for his gospel. So in this class, we're going to follow Matthew's gospel in tracing out Jesus' life and death and resurrection as, as Matthew sees him, uh, the, the, the king, the king of heaven and earth. Now, I want you to realize one thing, having said what I've just said, Jesus is at once all of these things. He, he's the king, he's the son of God, he's the son of man, he is the truth, the embodiment of the truth. I mean, he's all of this all at once. We merely are studying one of these strands in order to have a, a greater understanding of, of the whole uh, person of Jesus. So we start our, uh, with our study of Jesus as the king and his kingdom as seen through the eyes of Matthew. Now, if you plan to remain in this class, I know this is the first class and it's the summer weekend, July 4th, you know, and I, I understand that folks sometimes they, they sit in on one class and then they go sit in on another, and that's fine. You know. all, all we want, the elders and Marty and I, we just want folks to take advantage of the classes that we have. Doesn't matter what class you go to. But if you're going to stay in this class, you're going to have some reading assignments because 
I'm not doing a line by line study of the entire book of Matthew as I did in John, for example. In John I did it line by line, every line in John's gospel, but it lasted 31 lessons. Here we have 13, one quarter, 13 lessons. Don't have time to do a line by line. So we're going to have 13 lessons about Jesus as the King and His kingdom based on key passages in Matthew. And you're going to have to read up on the rest in order to be familiar with the texts that I'm using. Uh, I won't have time to read everything in class. And if you're wondering, the handout that you have, if you turn it on the back, you've got the reading assignments and the lesson uh, title on, um, you know, for each lesson that I'm, going to be, that I'm going to be doing. So if you're a regular Bible reader, daily Bible reader, how about just including this in your regular uh, reading? That way you'll be up on uh, the material that I'm, going to, uh, that I'm going to do. Okay, so you'll note uh, from your handout that our first lesson deals with the birth of Jesus, the King, and that is in Matthew chapter 2 beginning in verse 1. Let's read together. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? Notice so early on in the gospel, the term king of the Jew. For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. Then Herod, Herod rather, secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went, uh, uh, they went their way. Uh, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. Then they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Now, although what is described here is the birth of Jesus, I want you to note that Matthew provides very little information about the actual birth itself. In chapter one, he traces out Jesus' genealogy from Abraham to David down to Joseph, uh, Jesus' early father. Now, he does this to show that Jesus uh, is a direct and true descendant of Abraham. And he does it right at the beginning of his gospel um, in order to establish Jesus' claim to be the Messiah. Since no one who was not a descendant of Abraham, specifically through David, could claim to be the Messiah according to the scripture. Very important. So if you're going to be talking about Jesus the King, Jesus the King of the Jews, the very first thing you must establish is that he has a right to be called that according to Jewish law and according to Jewish scripture. So from the very beginning he establishes, okay, this child born in Bethlehem, irregardless of the humble circumstances, is in the, line, is in the proper lineage according to scripture, according to prophets, is in the proper lineage to be the king of the Jews. So this being done, he moves on to briefly describe Mary's conception by the power of the Holy Spirit, the prophecy of his role as savior, Joseph's taking her as wife, and then a simple declaration of Jesus' sub subsequent birth. Not a lot of time, doesn't spend a lot of chapters. You know, he just gets right to the point, uh, being careful to demonstrate <clears throat> Jesus' genealogy. All of this that I've just mentioned uh, was introduced in the first chapter. Okay? So Matthew saves the details for the character surrounding Jesus' birth and it is from them that we learn more of his royal nature. So he describes the people you know, who are witnessing this birth and who are there uh, during the, the beginning of his life and from them he will then extrapolate, he will then demonstrate uh, who he believes uh, Jesus is. So let's talk about the, uh, 
the wise men, the Magi. There are a lot of fables and traditions that have been developed about these particular people. For example, that there were three of them. You, know, you see that on Christmas cards, you know, three kings, three guys on three camels. We know about that because they brought three gifts. We don't know this for sure because the Bible doesn't say the exact number. Many scholars doubt that there would only be three individuals traveling you know, with this kind of wealth uh, from this far uh, because the roads were dangerous, many bandits and so on and so forth. So it was a caravan and a caravan are a lot of people, attendants, servants, the people to take care of the animals, the food, the cooking, so on and so forth. What we do know is recorded in the pages of the New Testament. What we do know is that they were from Babylon because this was the only nation that had serious study of the stars at that time, either in astronomy, astronomy, the position of the stars, the size of the stars, the movement of the stars, that's astronomy, but they also had a serious, if you wish, study of astrology. Uh, astrology tries to discern the meaning or the effect of the stars on human beings. They were Gentiles who knew somehow about the hope and the promise to the Jews concerning a Savior, the Messiah. How would they know such a thing? People from so far, how would they know about a Messiah? How would they know about the prophecies? Well, if you were in another class that I taught in this auditorium a while back, it wouldn't be so surprising to realize that Daniel, do we remember Daniel? Daniel lived and he prophesied concerning the Jewish Messiah while he lived among the Babylonians 600 years before. And so if you're wondering how did the knowledge of that get all the way you know, to that far country, well we know that Daniel preached and prophesied at that time. As a matter of fact in Daniel chapter 2 verse 48 it says that Daniel was made chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. And so the wise men of Babylon, they, these three here, they were part of the wise men of that nation. And so it's not so hard to realize that many of the prophecies uh, may not have been recorded there, but were handed down from uh, one generation to another. So Matthew describes a star that they saw while in their country, and then again when they arrived in Judea, which ultimately led them to the baby uh, Jesus. Again, the Bible doesn't tell us how they made the connection between the unusual star that they observed in the country, in their own country, and the birth of the Jewish Messiah. We don't know what the connection is. Doesn't mean that there wasn't a connection. You know, there obviously was a connection because they, you know, undertook an arduous and dangerous journey based on their understanding of the connection between the star that they saw and the birth of this royal figure that was going to take place in um, Judea. Um, as the Bible does so many times, uh, it simply states that the star signaled that the Jewish Messiah promised by the prophets was born and based on this they made their way to Jerusalem. Uh, nothing unusual there. The Bible tells us that from the things that are not seen, God created the things that are seen. You know, do we understand the physics of that? No. The science of that? The dynamics? We don't understand that. The Bible simply says, look, the things that you don't see, from those things God created the things that you do see. Well, I, I understand that and I accept that. Well, in the same way, uh, the Bible simply gives us, as we say in French, un fait accompli, a done thing, a done thing. They saw the star, they knew it was, there was a connection, they simply uh, left because of that. Now, of course, a, a caravan of high officials, because these men usually served as advisors to the kings or to the governors, the magi, from the east, coming from the east, asking questions about the birth of a Jewish king, another title conferred on the Jewish Messiah. This questioning was bound to create a stir, and of course, as we read, it did. The star they saw was a signal of the birth. They traveled to the most logical place to find a king, and where would that be? Well, that would be the city of the king. You know, Jerusalem, they, they didn't go to Bethlehem, they went to Jerusalem. They figured, okay, if a king is born, 
in Judea, in Israel, where would that king be? Well, he's going to be where the palace is. That was their thinking. Okay. So their questions draw the interest of the present king of the Jews, a man named Herod, and we'll talk about him in a moment. Uh, and so Herod consults with the priests and teachers about the exact location given by scripture of the birthplace of the Messiah. And so the, the teachers quote the Old Testament prophet Micah, chapter five, verse two, as the prophecy indicating the future birthplace of the Messiah. Now, the way uh, it was quoted suggests that even though Bethlehem was a small place within the land of Judea, um, which itself was only one part of the entire nation, uh, the way that Micah writes it, he says that from this place a leader would come who would lead not only the city, not only the tribe, but the entire nation. In other words, a king. Okay? So early on, Matthew connects the, the idea that the Messiah, not just a, a Jewish savior, would not just be an individual, but would be also a royal individual, Messiah and king. And he ties these two ideas together early on in his gospel. Now, there's a problem here. The present king, Herod, questions them as to the exact date that they saw the star so as to determine the time frame of the birth. And he does this in secret so as to not arouse suspicion and curiosity among the, among the people. So you know, Herod pretends to be eager to find this king as the wise men are and he sends them along their way with instructions you know, to report back to him the exact location of the child. I want to worship this king too. Of course, his plan is to get rid of this threat to his power, but he can't let them know about this. Pretty obvious stuff. Now, since he can't kill them, you know, he could kill them, get rid of these guys, but since he can't kill them for fear of retaliation by their foreign ruler, because they're important men, and arousing questions from his own people, he kind of sends them along. Now Matthew explains that once they are pointed in the direction of Bethlehem, which is about two hours south of Jerusalem, they again see the star that guides them to exactly where the, uh, in the city where the child is with uh, his parents. Now there's been a lot of speculation that this star was really a, you know, a comet or a shooting star or an exploding star in order to give a kind of a non-miraculous explanation to what these men saw. But the Bible clearly states that the star was special in some way to distinguish it from other stars and in some way to signal somehow the event of the birth of Christ at that particular moment in history. And you know what? Let's not be surprised at that, shall we? Let's not be surprised that people do that. It's nothing new. People, men, you know, have been trying to you know, undo the miraculous, trying to give you know, common explanations for the things that happened. So that's nothing new and it'll always be there. Don't, let's not let that discourage us. The thing that we're going by, of course, is what the Bible actually teaches us. So the Bible is teaching us that there was something special about this star that guided them. That's good enough for me. God never lied to me. The promise, he never made the promise that everything he was going to tell me, I was going to understand all the inner workings of it. He never made that promise. The promise is that God cannot lie. That's the promise. And that's good enough. That's good enough for me. So the Bible also says this very same star appeared once again after their arrival to lead them to the very house where Jesus was. Now the timing, the two appearances, the position in the sky, low enough or bright enough to point out a particular house, tell us that you know, this was no comet, this was no shooting star, but a, a body of light especially provided by God to lead these men to Christ. I tell you, you know, if, if God can send angels to direct the shepherds to Christ, He can as easily provide a star to do the same thing for the Gentiles to find the king that they longed uh, to see. So they find the child in a house. You know, we, read, we read that just previously in our passage with his mother. Joseph is not mentioned at all. 
uh, because Mary's the one holding the baby. Uh, Jesus was born in a manger, but it seems that at some time later, Joseph was able to secure a more permanent place to stay. And a manger, we always see, a, it looks like a barn, it looks like an old barn, you know, we, again, Christmas cards and things. You know. But uh, the mangers and, and places to, to put animals, usually, especially in that area, were in caves. There are lots of hills there, lots of small mountains, and, and these are dotted with caves. And as, as I've explained before, uh, the animals would be inside the cave and they'd just build a, you know, an outer fence to keep them in, uh, a, a lot better protection. We see uh, many pictures of Jesus like in a wooden trough, you know, usually that was made out of stone, it was carved out, not a big thing, but we've been so affected by the visual, you know, the visual portrayal of Christ and His birth through Christmas, the celebration of Christmas, that sometimes that visual artistic portrayal is not accurate according to what the Bible actually, actually teaches. So usually you see you know, the wise men, the shepherds, the animals, Joseph, Mary, the baby, they're all packed together in this kind of barn. But the, the wise men, you know, it says, they, they went to the house, they found a place where he uh, was staying. Doesn't change anything, really, you know, the outcome of things, but it's always good to know, to be accurate with the, uh, with the details. So the wise men immediately worshiped the child. Now they prostrate themselves before him, as was the manner of worship or humbling oneself before God or the king. These are you know, in our, our modern time, these were, let's say, governors you know, of states. All right, let's just say, that, that, was the, that was the height of their position in government. And these individuals come to a, a rented house somewhere and a little baby born to these very poor people and upon, not a word is spoken, and upon seeing him, Prostrate means you're down on the ground, you're flat on your ground, the nose, your nose is touching the ground. They prostrate themselves before this uh, individual. A very dramatic scene, a high impact scene, if you wish. They don't see just a child. They correctly, and we don't know how, they see who and what this child is and is destined to become according to scripture. Now what they understood about him is seen in the gifts that they bring, not what they say, because the Bible doesn't record what they say. It'd be nice if we could get some dialogue between wise men number one and wise men number two and wise men number three, but there is none. The only way we can understand their feelings, the only way we can understand you know, what they're thinking is by interpreting the gifts that they bring. So what do they bring? First of all, they bring gold. Uh, interesting thing about gold at that time, gold was not found in Babylon. It was a very expensive, Some, somebody had to buy it. It was the property of kings and only, and there's a good reason, only kings could afford to buy gold or to own uh, gold. Um, to offer the baby gold was to give him a gift in keeping with his position, a royal gift for a royal person. Uh, another gift, frankincense. Um, this substance was a type of sweet incense, very refined. It came from India. Uh, its main usage was for worship purposes. You know, you burn incense. It was burned as an offering to the gods in religious services. Now think for a second. The gold, I get the gold. You know, even a baby has use for gold because the parents are going to be able to use the gold you know, to buy diapers or whatever. You know, you know what I'm saying? You've got a use for the gold. But as a child, Jesus had absolutely no use for frankincense. It, it, it was given to him as a way of recognizing his divine nature because incense was something that was offered to the, to the God. So symbolically, they were recognizing the divinity of this child. And then uh, myrrh was an aromatic gum from which perfume was drawn. It was used in preparing corpses for burial, among other things. Again, Jesus as a child had absolutely no use for myrrh. 
but it was given in anticipation of the purpose of His coming, and that was to die on the cross as an atonement for sins. So the gifts are given to reflect who this child really was in a witness of faith. He was the king, he was God, he was sacrifice. All these things, all these ideas are communicated to the reader, communicated to the parents, communicated to other people around them uh, through the offering of these particular gifts. So after their time with Jesus, Matthew informs us that the wise men are warned by God, this time in a dream, to avoid Herod, and so they make their way home by a different, uh, different route. So let's talk about Herod, the earthly king that we met before. Throughout this narrative, we see the hand of Herod trying to manipulate the wise men to kind of gain information for his own murderous ends. And we know from history that Herod was not beyond killing his own family members in order to hang on to his throne. He, he killed his own children you know, if they got too close to, too close to his power. So he, uh, Herod, uh, he had received his throne from the Romans. He was a, a Idumean, in other words, he was a half Jew. Okay? And politically, he had received the throne through the auspices of the Romans who control the territory. But we need to realize that in receiving the title King of the Jews from the Romans, he had violated God's word in displacing David's heirs from ruling God's people because God said it would be the heirs of David that would and should rule, that should be called King of the Jews. And by receiving this title and not being in the lineage, Herod immediately was in conflict with God's word. Uh, he was not fully Jewish, as I mentioned. He was not of David's royal lineage, and he ruled in the name of a pagan emperor. Yet he understood the scriptures enough to know that there had been a Messiah promised by God that he was sent to rule and that he would be sent to rule the people. And so he took the wise men's search seriously to the point that he was going to try to find and destroy this child. Now, if we were to continue reading in the rest of the chapter, um, in an effort to do so, he figures, you know, I, I, you know, a blunt instrument, you know, scattershot technique. So he decides to kill every male child two years and under in Bethlehem, just in case, in order to get him. And the idea that he does it in two years gives you a, a, a kind of an idea of the time frame. We read you know, 12 or 13 verses and we think it's all happening in a 24 hour period. But we're, we're talking days and months that goes by here. Okay? So he, he figures two years I'm safe. Somewhere within a two year frame this child appeared. Now what is so strange about his behavior is that if the prophecy concerning the Messiah was being fulfilled by the birth of this child, how did he think that he could stop God's hand? <laughs> You know, he's, he's thinking, I'm going to stop the Messiah sent from God. I'm going to stop him from being born. So first of all, you've got to believe that there's a Messiah sent by God. You've got to believe that there is a God. How on earth did he think that he could stop that from happening through human means? It goes to show you the hubris, the, the pride you know, of this individual. So Matthew, uh, opens his gospel with a very brief description of Jesus' physical birth and his earthly background. And he, he, he shows, however, that from the very beginning, Jesus was recognized and honored uh, as, different, uh, as different things. Um, uh, for example, he is honored as the divine Messiah. They search for him according to the prophecies concerning the divine Messiah and Savior. This is who, this is who they're looking for. Secondly, the king. He's recognized as a king. The Magi recognized that as the Messiah, he carried the title of king. That's who the Messiah was to be, among other things. He was also a high priest, wasn't he? He was also a prophet, wasn't he? 
He was also the, the atonement, the sacrificial, you know, he was all these things. Uh, an interesting study is to go through the New Testament and look at all the titles and all the, you know, the purposes of Christ. But among all of these, he was king, and Matthew opens his gospel by underscoring that very important idea. And then, of course, he was the sacrifice. They understood that the Messiah's task was to die in order to save the people. Their gift of myrrh symbolized their understanding of this. How they understood it, we, we don't know. So this episode sets the tone for the rest of Matthew's gospel where he's going to continue to describe Jesus in the imagery of king and ruler. Although you know, uh, this is not a parable, or it's not a teaching section, there are certain practical lessons that we can draw from this encounter between the wise man and the royal child. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, this, this, this scenario here is not meant to be like a parable or like a, like a lesson, uh, and yet we can draw lessons from it. And I just want to draw a couple here. The first is God uses many ways to reach people. many ways to reach people. He uses a star, something that these men could relate to in order to eventually bring them to Christ. He was speaking in their language. They studied the stars. They put a lot of you know, emphasis on the meaning of the stars. Did they, was their understanding of what the stars meant accurate? No. To some extent it was, as they studied the stars as far as distance and light and movement, yes, but as astrology that the stars had an effect on men, no. That's, a, that's the occult. And God hates the occult, right? Because the occult assumes that there's a power aside from God that they can manipulate in some way. That's what the occult is all about. Trying to manipulate unseen things by seeing things, whether it's a lucky rabbit's foot or a, a, a brew or words or incantation or whatever you do, that's the occult. When you're trying to manipulate the spirit world from something within the physical world, that's the occult. So certainly God doesn't approve of that, but this is where they were at, these guys. And so God used their language to bring them closer to the truth and to make a very important point. So sometimes God uses, you know, a Bible track you know, left on a bus or a, a subway. Uh, an ad in a newspaper, as was my case, a tiny little ad in a local paper you know, that said, sinners are welcome at the Church of Christ. Just happened to see that. Piqued my curiosity. I went to, to the church that had that ad in the paper. As I've told you in the past, I was the only person that ever responded to that ad. That ad only appeared one time and I was the only person that responded to it. And yet, and I'm, I don't say this as a boast for myself, I only boast in Christ, but look at all the people that I've been able to speak the gospel to in 35 years of ministry, all from this tiny little free ad in one newspaper. Again, as I've told you before, that's why I so believe in the use of media to spread the gospel. It's so powerful. So God uses an ad in a newspaper, maybe an invitation to Sunday school. How many people have I met they say, well, I became a Christian. Well, actually, it was my next door neighbor that invited me to VBS. And I went to VBS and my parents weren't Christians, but I loved it so much that I kept going with my neighbor and then I became a Christian at teen camp or whatever. You, you never know. God uses all kinds of things. Sometimes an illness. You're sick and you're really sick and you start thinking, I, I could die from this sickness. And then you start thinking, and if I died, what would happen? And then you start asking yourself the really important questions. You know? So sometimes, sometimes God uses that. Or, or a service rendered, or a television show, or a website, or a missionary, a letter, whatever. God has a million ways to reach out to someone who needs Jesus Christ. Our job is not to decide ahead of time what will work and what will not work. That's not our job. Our job is to keep trying until it works, or until Jesus returns. A lot of parents said to me, oh boy, I've been trying to reach out to my son or my daughter or my granddaughter, or my husband, you know, and I, I want to quit. And I always answer them, are they dead yet? 
Uh, no, uh, then don't stop. <laughs> Has Jesus returned? Uh, no, uh, then don't stop. All right, lesson number two before the second bell. Salvation is by faith. Even though they saw an amazing star, they had to pack their bags and head out. That required faith. Even though the Jewish teacher said the Messiah was supposed to be born in Bethlehem and not Jerusalem, which made more sense to them, they had to leave sense behind and try to find Him in Bethlehem. That required faith. Even though everything pointed to this baby Jesus as the king, the poor house and the poor parents did not lend a lot of credibility to this fact. So to bow down and worship the child of these poorest of people, that required faith. Today, you know, we, we can't see a star, we can't touch the babe, but God calls us through His word to come to Jesus in repentance and baptism. That step forward always requires faith. And then one more lesson, the word is the only true guide to Jesus. Although the special star played a role in their finding the babe, the word is what truly led them to him. It was Daniel's words long before that had captured their hearts and set them looking for God's Messiah. Because there was nothing in the star. The star was simply a sign you know, pointing them, but they had to have the information. Micah's words, right? Micah 5.2. Micah's words confirmed the birthplace of the true Messiah. They had to go to the Word to find it. God's word through the angel kept them and the baby safe from Herod. So we have to be careful not to let feelings or coincidences or opinions or signs lead our spiritual lives. We live by every word that comes from the mouth of God, not signs, not traditions, not feelings. So test everything against God's word. It is the standard for truth. It is the standard for what is right and wrong. It is the standard for pleasing God. So we believe Jesus is king because the word of God tells us this. This belief then is sure and will never change. As I said to you at the beginning of the lesson, uh, God cannot lie. He didn't promise he'd explain all the details, but he did tell us that he cannot lie. So if the word tells us something, then we can accept it as true.